Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Oleg Minin, and uh, I teach in the Russian Grecian Studies program, uh, one of the sponsors of this event. And um, I'd like to welcome all of you uh, to tonight's event, uh, which is a conversation uh, between uh, Roger Berkowitz and Artemi Magul uh, on one of Hannah Arendt's uh, texts concerning the notion of revolution, as you know. Uh, Roger Berkowitz is a professor of politics, uh, philosophy, and human rights here at Bard, and he's also the founder and academic director of the Hannah Arendt Center. Now, Artemi Magun is visiting Bard from St. Petersburg, Russia, where he is a professor of uh, democratic theory, and as he was telling me, he was the chair of the, of the Department of Political Science and Sociology at the European University. And of course, he's also teaching at Smolny College in St. Petersburg. And we're very fortunate and happy uh, to have Artemi with us here today uh, and for the semester. Now, the conversation is going to be moderated by uh, my colleague Thomas Wild, who is the professor of German studies here at Bard, and he's also the research director of uh, the Hannah Arendt Center. Now, uh, before I turn uh, the floor to Tomas, uh, I would like to say that this event was envisioned um, at the beginning of the semester as a part of the October-November offerings um, here at Bard, marking the centennial of the uh, 1917 Russian Revolution. And uh, I think to some extent the 1917 Russian Revolution uh, will also be part of uh, this conversation. So I would like to close by thanking both uh, Artemi and Roger for agreeing to speak, and Tomas for uh, moderating. And welcome, Tomas, to take over uh, what promises to be a very interesting uh, conversation. So. All right. Uh, yeah, I would also like to welcome everybody uh, to this event and uh, upcoming conversation. The one thing I would like to add by introducing two speakers, I think we have two speakers here who are both political theorists and political philosophers, first people who think about traditions and vocabulary of the political and who are also very interested, both of them, in, uh, in the politics that are going on, in contemporary uh, politics. Uh, so I expect we are we will have a conversation about uh, that is straddling the political reality and uh, political theory. And with no further ado, I would like to turn it over uh, to the two speakers, and I think we are going to start with uh, my team. Okay. So thanks for having us. And uh, yes, indeed, uh, I see this uh, discussion as uh, uh, one yet. Uh, another event in this series of celebrations or commemorations. There is a uh, big debate, first of all. Be before people start to discuss uh, the anniversary of the revolution, they usually discuss whether it's a celebration or commemoration, and then sometimes they take an hour to discuss that, and then they never <laughs> move on to the subject of discussion, but we will not be uh, like that, even though I think this will come up. Um, uh, and, uh, of course, uh, Arendt's book uh, is uh, directly related to our uh, jubilee because uh, uh, one of the things that it did in 1963 when it was published uh, uh, was to uh, renew the revolutionary problematic. Uh, so, uh, I will just say a few words <clears throat> about this book, and I apologize uh, to those who know it by heart, of which surely there are, there are some, but maybe someone has not yet learned it by heart, and uh, <clears throat> maybe I will just remind what it is. Uh, so, on the one hand, this is Arendt's, uh, 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 one of her opus magnums, I think, in, in, at least in political theory. And a, a book that is conceived as a, um, uh, as a theory of modern politics. She, has a, she, she had previously written uh, a theory of politics, period. But then with the, uh, which, which was uh, uh, the human condition, but uh, with this book, it turned out that there are two theories, two, two, two theories of politics. One, ancient equals universal theory of politics in general, and another, a modern theory of politics. So a theory of politics which would be valid uh, for modernity, which for Arendt is uh, <coughs> uh, quite special. 
So if um, uh, the, the, the former uh, uh, general theory of politics has to do with uh, uh, universal transcendental conditions of a human action as such, in modernity the same uh, uh, hu human feature, uh, uh, the uh, cap capacity of action, becomes historical. So suddenly we are talking not about uh, what politics is and always should be, but uh, about certain historical events which uh, <clears throat> uh, make politics emerge here and now, or there and then, certain moments in space and time. So I think it's a very different argument from the previous one, from the human condition. And again, I think uh, uh, Arendt uh, 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 just opposes them and uh, <clears throat> uh, has one, uh, um, well, distinguishes with uh, historical uh, mm, a validity of these of these claims of, of, of these theories. So uh, this is the theoretical pertinence. It's the book about how to begin, but it's also a book about how to begin in history, which means to begin something historically new, historically new, something that is not natural, something that had not yet existed. Uh, <clears throat> and then there is a certain apology, I would say, of revolution as an event where such a beginning, such an inception is possible. This is the theoretical part, but there is also a political part. And in Arendt, you cannot, you can never divide it. The political statement of this book is very important, is maybe even more obvious than the uh, political statement of the human condition. Because uh, Arendt is saying that revolution is a good thing, uh, well, very roughly speaking, <clears throat> uh, and that uh, revolution is uh, essential for the United States of America and its political uh, culture, its political uh, uh, essence, <clears throat> which is relatively counterintuitive. Uh, well, also because there is a debate, you know, in, uh, 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 some uh, particularly leftist historiography don't uh, call American a Civil War Revolution, but predominantly, of course, they do. But still, the accent put on this uh, revolutionary nature of the United States of America is, of course, polemic. Arendt is to say that revolution is a good thing and it should be subtracted, withdrawn from the Marxist context. So if in the traditional outlook we have the liberal democratic United States of America and the leftist revolutionary Soviet Union stemming from the Russian Revolution, 1917, Strange radicals, utopians, uh, who are dangerous because of their nuclear bombs, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Arendt is saying they are indeed very dangerous people, but not because they had a revolution. Revolution is a good thing. And actually, we Americans, and she certainly identifies herself with uh, America, this book is one of her, well, maybe main tribute of hers to her new uh, fatherland. But um, we Americans are real revolutionaries, and you Soviets are pseudo-revolutionaries. Uh, or, well, you are revolutionaries, but your revolutions went really bad way. That's the rhetorical message. <clears throat> uh, so it has um, a nice part, which is to say that America should stop uh, organizing the right-wing coup d'etat and should uh, start supporting real emancipatory revolutions, because that's its uh, historical creed. Uh, and uh, there is a not so nice message, which is to say that uh, uh, Soviet Union, with, it, with, its, uh, with its expansion of revolution, gets the revolution wrong, should st stop my, uh, uh, supporting all these uh, leftist revolutions, or if it does, it should be countered by uh, 
firm hegemonic response from the United States of America. Um, so it's a Cold War book, I think, but doesn't say it's bad. Uh, <clears throat> this was the period, this was the time. She took her sides. She, she was a political person. She took her sides. But she tried, I, I think what's nice about the book is that she tried to make her side um, uh, to, to, to look a little more appealing uh, than it actually <laughs> historically was. Uh, so, uh, to uh, wrap this intro up, um, uh, just to remind that ultimately bo uh, uh, both types of revolutions go uh, wrong. Uh, and she draws what I would call a certain dialectic in, in each case, uh, although it's a de degenerative dialectic. Uh, and in the case of uh, uh, European revolution, for a, let's say continental revolution to which Russia belongs, uh, the, the dialectic develops in the following way. You have uh, a great moment of beginning, you have the revolutionary event, you have the constituent power, but uh, there is... Uh, uh, an antagonism brought in uh, uh, by the uh, by virtue of uh, the involvement of the poor. So the poor are so um, how to say um, uh, the the cause of the poor is so urgent. Uh, the poor are such a, a powerful political force that. Um, it's on the one hand it's irresistible it's like a torrent on the other hand uh, it's uh, it also uh, uh, generates uh, enormous violence and uh, makes the uh, revolutionary politics uh, very antagonistic so uh, the uh, freedom initially involved in the revolutionary action in the revolt in the uprising is somehow swallowed by this torrent uh, uh, which has to do with the poor. So again, uh, politically, it's, it's very charged. It's very charged, and of course her contemporaries saw that. But, okay, she has this story, and this story kind of works. And, and so, since the French Revolution, this was the case she claims in all the major continental revolutions. In America, fortunately, this was not so, because the poverty was not so extreme. There was poverty, of course there was inequality, but she claims that this was not that much of an issue. And probably she's historically right, yes, relatively, relatively, it was not that much of an issue. <clears throat> and also, uh, 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 let's, uh, I would say cynically, American Revolution remained in the hands of the rich. Uh, uh, and the, um, uh, the, uh, even if there was poverty, the, their power was not contested. It, it, this was a Republican Revolution. But nevertheless, it was a revolution. They changed the regime. They uh, built a, a democratic, of course, well, some a liberal system with some uh, elements of participation, and they, they spent a lot of time talking about the new epoch that they inaugurate. So, in this, um, uh, uh, RNT is right. The problem with uh, um, American revolution that it was so nonviolent that it became forgotten. So that, as it turned out, in the course of the book. And I'm not sure that Arendt actually conceived it from the beginning, but the conclusion of the book is that the American uh, Revolution actually went wrong too, because it was forgotten. Uh, it was such a victorious, successful revolution, they uh, uh, took uh, that much care about uh, stability of their own foundations. They founded a polity, they created institutions, then of course they were concerned that these institutions work and that no, no, nothing uh, threatens them, that uh, uh, th th there is order, law and order involved in these institutions. So uh, they, uh, uh, they went too conservative. They, uh, they um, uh, put too much weight on this, again, genuine revolutionary desire to found a steady thing. Uh, um, here, actually, I would say, uh, philosophically, aren't uh, perhaps at, at her strongest, because uh, it's a very Heideggerian discussion, right? Do you install something? It's a great uh, founding moment. It's a moment of freedom. But unfortunately, when you install something, you also pause it, set, fix, 
and then it goes on uh, in a fixed uh, form uh, to uh, block your horizon. So uh, this unfortunately was the destiny of American Revolution. So we have, a, we have two symmetrical stories that are both wrong. And uh, the question is for her to revive, so to re, to in, actually to, in both cases, to revive the revolutionary element and to, uh, to, to return it to life, so to say. Uh, she thought that America was more capable to return to life the revolutionary message. And I will shut up here, although I, I, I will uh, 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 yet uh, uh, talk about the applicability of uh, all this to contemporary political situation, which is kind of obvious, but uh, that's after Roger uh, also speaks. So this is not a revolutionary tribunal, but uh, a council, maybe. <laughs> so that's why we have multiple voices. Yeah, and we're going to try and have a conversation. Um, uh, and so I'm going to pick up on a couple of points that Artyom made and, and see what I want to say about them. Um, he began by saying that uh, on revolution uh, is a, is a mod theory of modern politics, um, which is, is, is not a way I would characterize it, um, which is not to say that I don't think it can be read that way. Um, I don't think of Arendt as someone who is a theorist. Um, and I don't think she's offering a theory of politics, uh, ancient politics or, or modern politics. Um, there, you know, there, there's certainly uh, one can find in this book um, a kind of uh, support for what we might call a federal constitutional republic. Um, and to the extent uh, uh, one finds support for a federal constitutional republic in this book, one can say that Arendt has a theory of politics that supports a federal constitutional republic. But um, I actually don't think that's what the book is doing, or at least it's not how I usually read it. To me, this is a, 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 a book-length sustained treatment on one idea, which is the idea of freedom. Um, the, the, the book begins with a prologue or a preface, whatever she calls it, um, in which she says that you know, we've, we've entered a period of, of history in which um, we can no longer have uh, wars, uh, which of course is a questionable claim. Um, and she says basically um, wars, which were typically fought for interests, um, are no, you know, to fight a nuclear war for interests is, is lunacy. Uh, and so um, the, the old idea of, of war seems to be, to be over. The really only way to justify um, war today or anything is to say you're fighting for freedom. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's the last meaningful justification. Um, and so she announces in this prologue that freedom has become this, uh, the last meaningful uh, justification for war or revolution or civil war or, or whatever it is. Um, and then she says the problem is that most people today don't care about freedom. Uh, you know, we live at a time in which security is valued much more highly than freedom and safety and welfare and all these things. We care much more about the social question and whether people are fed than we do whether people are free. And so um, she says, all right, how do we think about this problem of freedom in, in, in the modern age? And she says, well, the one activity, the one event in the modern age, which seems to take a risk and suggest that we're going to um, uh, do something that might lead to insecurity, uh, but in the name of freedom is revolution, or at least one idea of revolution. And so in the, in the first chapter on, on the meaning of, of revolution, she identifies revolution with freedom. And she distinguishes freedom from liberty, right? And she says, liberty is something like, you know, liberty from, uh, you, you, you fight for, you know, you can use the Arab Spring, I think, is a good example. Uh, you know, you, you fight for liberty from a strong man or a tyrant. Um, and, 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 and to the extent you topple a tyrant, you are liberated. But then you have a situation in which you're not free. Freedom 
for her means something different from liberty. It means living a life in which people are uh, free to self-govern and to act uh, and participate uh, in, in, in their way of life in ways that matter in public. And back, to, back all the way to her book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, she says, look, there's no human right to life, there's no human right to food, we're all gonna die. To say that we have a human right to food is, to life is ridiculous in her mind. What we have, the only human life, is the life to be a member of a political community and to act and speak in public in ways that matter. To be able to act and speak so that people have to respond to you is to her what it means to be human. And freedom uh, is that ability to have institutions, as far as I understand it, in which you can act and speak and have a chance to begin something new and people will respond to you in ways that may or may not matter depending on the success of your action. Um, she then divides the, the history of revolutions into two parts, as, as Archie Holmes said. On the one hand is the American Revolution, on the other hand is the French Revolution. And um, she thinks that the French Revolution, and, and she thinks that what really distinguishes these two uh, revolutions is their response to freedom. Um, in the French Revolution, she says, for a whole host of reasons that we can't fully go into, and at least right now we can do it in Q&A if you're interested, the, free, the revolution gets caught up in the question of necessity. It gets caught up in the que what she calls the social question of how to make people equal and how to make people comfortable and safe and secure. And insofar as it gets caught up in that question, it sees life as the highest good. Um, life in the sense of um, our ability to keep ourselves and other people alive, fed, and happy. Uh, and, um, and that this uh, depoliticizes uh, the revolution. And it, while it started as a revolution based on freedom and liberty, it ends up becoming a revolution focused on these questions of, of poverty and, and, and life as opposed to freedom. Whereas in the American Revolution, she says, and here's where we get into some very, uh, some quicksand, if you want to put it, and some difficult questions, right? She says, the American Revolution had the great good fortune to exist in a place where the social question didn't matter. And um, what she means by that is not that there was no poverty in America. She says there was poverty in America. But she distinguishes poverty and misery. This is the first step, and it's the least controversial step. The next step is going to be more controversial. The first step is to say, in America there was poverty, but even the poor people still were free. They had the ability to go to town hall meetings. They usually owned their own land. They, um, they might have been dirt poor, but they could farm, they could take care of themselves, and they saw themselves as citizens. And they saw themselves as people who were part of the public world. And, and so there was poverty, but there was not misery as there was in Europe. And then she says, but of course this was ridiculous because there were millions of slaves in America who were not part of the public world and didn't have property and didn't have citizenship. And in fact, per capita, there were more slaves in America than there were miserable people in France. And so she says, how could this be that in America the revolution completely ignored slaves, whereas in the French Revolution, the French Revolution was um, taken over by the miserable, the miserable. And and her answer is that the American revolutionaries and the Europeans who came to America simply ignored the slaves. They didn't see them. They were invisible. And she calls this the, um, the great sin of the American Revolution and the great sin of, uh, uh, and, the, and the, the original sin of the American Revolution. And yet she says it had a a good or lucky consequence, which is that because the revolutionaries ignored slavery, um, 
they didn't concern themselves with the social question and focused simply on the question of freedom. And they created a, a constitution and, and, and a revolution that aimed at um, uh, creating a world in which people could act and speak and be free, which was more central, or at least part, as central to the American idea of, 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 of political life as that of creating one of equality and security. Um, obviously, this decision to ignore slavery uh, is, 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 is one that we um, and she was critical of, and yet she found it to have, um, for want of a better word, uh, a, golden, a golden lining, a silver lining, or as we put it, and we can, we can certainly talk about that. But what it led to in her mind, was that in America, unlike in France and unlike later in Russia, the focus was not on um, creating uh, um, social equality. It was creating a framework for um, people to act freely um, and to live and govern themselves <coughs> freely. And the key then, and this is where I think Artem sort of uh, talks about a theory of modern politics, um, is that uh, in order to live freely, two things are necessary for her. One is um, a political system that uh, encourages multiple sources and multiple centers of power. And so this is federalism. This is the idea that in America you had the 13 states, you had local town governments, you had county governments, you had nonprofits, you had civic organizations, and then you put on top of it the federal government. She says there was no sovereignty in America. There was no one center of power that was sovereign. They all fought against each other. And the result is that people felt empowered. They felt that their group had power. And the way to prevent any one group from taking over power was not passing laws or, or, or saying, you know, there's a limit on how much power you can have because she thinks that doesn't work, but only power um, contests power. Only power can resist power. And so what America did is it created this multiple uh, sources of power, um, which she says not only prevented one power from ruling them all, if you're a Lord of the Rings fan, mm -hmm. um, but it also, uh, in, it, it also kept alive the experience of acting and local governance um, that, uh, that kept people acting free, not just having freedom, but acting freely. And the second uh, uh, great innovation of America was not, was that in addition to this creating and preserving these institutions of power was that you also needed some authority, right? So typically, religion or tradition had provided an authority, and so that once you pass laws, those laws last. But in a world in which you have power passing new laws, how do you imagine these laws will last? How will this country per persevere over time and endure? And her answer was that the, somehow and it's a very complicated reasoning, but somehow the American Constitution came to be worshipped. And she argues that it was the worship of the American Constitution and the transfer of authority from the Roman Senate, and as they had understood in Rome, to the Supreme Court in the United States, which created uh, a, an authority in which people, um, even if they didn't ex agree with the laws or, or like the laws or didn't like the way the country was going, they respected the country as a constitutional, limited republic governed by a kind of magical, supreme, magical constitution with a magical Supreme Court that was trying to interpret the constitution in line with its founding principles, but willing to change those principles to grow. And thus, um, it would allow the, 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 the country to maintain its freedom and its institutions but also adapt to the modern um, world. Uh, and this, she thought, was the only successful modern revolution in which freedom and authority were created 
in a new way. As Archeom also said, the last chapter, the long last chapter, is about how this failed and how the American Revolution failed in the end and how um, there, in the end the centralization of government uh, in the federal government uh, on, on, on one hand took away the power from the people and the localities and corrupted the institutions of government. And on the question of authority, she's more mixed. Uh, and she says that in one sense, as long as the Constitution remains worshipped in the United States, there's still a hope that the American founding can be resurrected. But she's not very confident, I don't think. Um, there's a way this could be read as a Cold War book. Uh, I don't, you know, that's not how I read it. Uh, I think she's, I think this book is in many ways extremely critical of the 20th century America. I mean, if anything, it's, it's very positive about 18th and 19th century, early 19th century America, very critical about 20th century America. The idea that this is supporting a Cold War 20th century America, to me, is, is doesn't make um, a whole lot of sense, but I guess we could talk about that. Um, I think it's really about how around the world freedom is being threatened and lost to the social question. And America was the last place that a new foundation of freedom had happened, and it is now being threatened and lost. And it's a sad book, it's a tragic book, about that loss. So that's how I understand that book. Um, maybe we could, I don't know, if you want to respond or we can throw open the questions, or if you want to say anything. So what, what is freedom? Well, uh, what is freedom? Freedom is not this. I, it's not that I can do this. It's not freedom of the will, right? It's it for her. Freedom is political freedom. It's the freedom uh, to act and to be in public in ways that matter. Uh, so in in uh, in the essay, what is freedom? She says, you know, most philosophy they think of freedom as freedom of the will. Um, and or they think of freedom as you know to liberty to do what you you know freedom from. She says no, that's not what freedom is. Freedom is a political experience, and it's the experience of being able to um, build a common world together with others, and thus to act in public in ways that others will respond and create a, a meaningful common world together. That's what I think she means by freedom. Mm -hmm. A worldly uh, thing rather than an individual. Yeah, I mean, one has to act, but then people tell story. You know, you you act, and then people either ignore your act, and then your act is unsuccessful, or people tell stories about it. They react to it, and a new world begins to emerge out of that act. And so, the great acts in history are ones that um, initiate. Um, a new conversation, and they start to build something, and that's what she means by beginning something new, freedom. Freedom is the ability to begin something new as a public, as a public worldly activity. That's how I understand freedom. Yeah, I agree with this, and uh, certainly she, she has the entire text on freedom. Uh, um, uh, uh, and uh, it's I, I think it's actually like the best theory of freedom that we have in the 20th century because I mean not many people tried and uh, there are some disastrous um, attempts like Isai Berlin uh, uh, people like him uh, Skinner is a little better but not far uh, far beyond uh, and I, Arendt she's really great because she says that uh, freedom is exist in the moment of its exercise and also that it has to do with the substantive qualities of action. It's not just, a formal condition. Just so my students know, he doesn't mean D.F. Skinner. No. Oh, <laughs> Skinner. We are reading D.F. Skinner today and I thought they might I'm think sorry. that you were saying Skinner had a freedom. These are two very famous men with the same name. Yeah. Are they related? No, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> probably I yes. someone else It's knows. a common name for my artisan straight probably. Uh, so, uh, 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 freedom uh, to, to be free is not enough that you uh, are set free. Like if you are a slave and if you are set free, it's not enough. Although it's good enough, but uh, it's good. But uh, to be freedom, to, uh, to be free, uh, there, something has to change in you. It's what you do that makes you free. 
and you need to be engaged in politics, in the public sphere, uh, you need also to act inventively, uh, and we are not always in this, uh, this condition. Our intent, again, as a Heideggerian, she understands very well that it's not like, I want to be free, and I decided to make a revolution tomorrow. This is precisely, uh, the, the revolution simply wouldn't happen. Uh, so even though it has to do with our beginnings, these beginnings don't happen in a vacuum, but uh, they depend on a, a certain condition. And that's why she emphasizes not simply the acts. Again, I return to my idea of two books. So the, the second book, Revolution, is uh, about the events, as, they, as we philosophers say, the finite transcendentals. Uh, um, so it's not enough simply to have the infinite transcendental, like uh, generally how politics is organized, but uh, you, it's also anchored in the here and now of event. Uh, and, and that's why the freedom that Roger evoked is really living freedom, which, uh, 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 which is not the freedom of will, because you cannot be free at your will. You can do something for it, but again, it doesn't depend only on you. It's collective, at least. Uh, the, um, the question is, and here I come to the political part, uh, what does she envision for um, today? Uh, in, uh, how do we institute freedom? Again, the, the, her previous, her former uh, response was, well, how do you institute freedom? You build a police, uh, you need uh, nice uh, democratic institutions, uh, many laws, uh, you, you build also walls, it should be small, and uh, uh, you have the conditions for action. Uh, but here it's more complicated, because uh, it seems that uh, freedom uh, does exist only at this uh, moment of constitution, which can be extended through memory, but... And she enthusiastically quotes Jefferson, who, of course, uh, suggested to organize revolutions once in 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, she, it's a little, she, she uses some irony, but not much. So um, it looks like she calls for something like a permanent revolution. Uh, even though um, this permanent revolution should happen uh, without a social question, without uh, much violence, in a more or less, um, uh, with, with a more or less functioning social fabric. It should not be that disastrous as you know, revolutions usually are, but they should happen. Otherwise, there is no, uh, there is no uh, oil to the, to, the, to the machine of freedom. Uh, uh, but she doesn't give an answer how. She gives one answer, and that's the, the, the most concrete that she gets. That, uh, the, the answer is councils, right? Uh, the, that uh, both American Revolution and the Continental Revolutions had something like councils or words. So uh, some self-generated, uh, self-organized small uh, committees, groups of people who decided to run their affairs. Uh, and uh, uh, during all the revolutions, there is this moment of self-organization, even though, of course, it's not, uh, uh, doesn't exhaust revolution. And Arendt says, here is the actual experience of freedom. Not uh, 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 legal free freedom, or formal freedom, not the, simply the freedom from something, but the, the freedom in which you actually participate that changes the entire climate. Of course, this, uh, these uh, um, require some moment of break. Normally, there are some bureaucrats working in the municipalities, so you wouldn't go there. Something must happen, that you come, you go, and say, I, I volunteer, I want to run this little, I don't know, Dutchess county. Uh, well, it's large enough. Uh, something should happen, and uh, uh, where do we uh, get those events? Uh, so, uh, she says that councils were always uh, suppressed, quenched in all revolutions, actually, American included. Uh, but, nevertheless, that this is some kind of source of hope. Uh, again, it's a tragic book, but nevertheless, there is uh, as, as always some promise even in the tragedy. 
so if we translate her politically, what does she say? What is she saying? She's saying that we need, uh, on the one hand, uh, st uh, working institutions that are faithful to the previous revolution, and on the other hand, we have a new revolution uh, uh, that would happen more uh, from time to time. Uh, again, she doesn't develop, but I think here she is really up to something. If we look at the contemporary philosophy like Alain Badiou, he, he says exactly the same, and he also uh, sees the same problem, which he cannot resolve. How can you be faithful to the event if there is a new event? Uh, this is again a dialectical moment, which I think is resolvable in principle if you have a balance between, uh, uh, between the authority and the institutions that are favorable to the eventual change of, uh, uh, of power. Right? Uh, uh, you need the, um, uh, the authoritative, authoritative or authoritarian even maybe institutions together with a grassroots democracy. That's the only way. And uh, the big uh, task, I mean, for Lenin, for example, it was already clear that this should be the way, but he didn't, uh, he did, he, he didn't come up with a solution. He didn't know how to do it. No one did. Uh, Mao Zedong also had this problem. He said, I want to be still your great leader and the party should uh, lead the country, but please make some cultural revolution on your own. And uh, you know what it ended with. So again, he tried, but it was not workable. Uh, in a sense, these uh, Arendt's uh, uh, political recipes are active right now, but they are active in a perverse um, international way, in the sense that there is a very strong, stable authority in the world. This is the stable authority of the United States of America. Yeah, still. Still, so far. So there are problems, but... Uh, and there are constantly revolutions. Like, again, Arendt was prophetic and also she influenced this process. If you look, probably every month there is a revolution. But she wouldn't call those revolutions, right, John? Why not? Because they're liberations. Uh, to be a revolution, no, 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 no. it has to actually establish and found freedom. Arendt would precisely call these events revolutions, unlike Marxist Leninists. Marxist Leninists say, Ukrainian revolution, what's that? Egyptian revolution, no, this makes no sense. She would say but it's a yes. and it, it has the potential wow, to become potential. a revolution. Everything ends badly, ultimately. But no. the, uh, but <laughs> Ukrainian revolution, for example, was successful. Uh, what was it? Uh, three years ago, it still exists. Uh, the Ukrainian They're regime. free in Ukraine? Well, wait a minute. We, in the in our Indian framework, they made a revolution. They are faithful to this revolution. They changed the regime. They are very happy, some of them. Uh, and very poor, and, 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 and they, they, they have this revolutionary rhetoric, totally, totally oriented, I don't see a problem in Arendt's framework with that. The, what my, my claim is... Arendt that, says that yeah. the American Revolution only became a revolution and succeeded after the Constitution was passed. Oh, they have a Constitution. Yeah, but you're talking about the 1776 to 1789, 13 years, plus till the Constitution became worshipped. That's when she says the revolution succeeds. It takes time. You have to found the institutions of freedom. Mm -hmm. So it's the success that... Uh, but still, you have a bet. Okay, you make yeah. a revolution, you try to do something, then either it fails or it wins. Yes, you know, you don't know, I agree. Uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, it's uh, our Arendtian ideology against Marxism, Marxism, Leninism, that in a way facilitates this uh, contagion of revolutions throughout the world. I agree. Most of them are simply not successful. Roger is absolutely right. Some of them are, but we don't know if they are radical enough. Uh, so uh, actually, it's nice. I, I, I don't know. Unfortunately, in Russia, the government is very smart, so it understood this scenario and blocked all the attempts of revolution. But uh, in other countries, I would be glad to live in a post-revolutionary country. Uh, you know, many new things, new opportunities. But uh, of course, this is a little. This is this vandalizes the situation. If we look globally, Arendt's uh, system works in the sense that there is the stable power of the West and the revolutions on the periphery that the West helps to facilitate. It's precisely the Jeffersonian model, but 
uh, expanded to the entire world. I think if we are conscious of that, and we write something like that into the chart of uh, Charter of the United Nations, maybe it's a nice thing. Right? <laughs> As a Hegelian, what do, you the charter, the, what do you want to write into the charter? This system that you know there is the, the there is the center of the of the world. Okay, the the Great uh, Security Council. And then other other countries have in 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 this will be her dystopia. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> being a little a little, a little ironic. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, this uh, is to create sovereignty in one wait, place. Wait, yeah. wait. Uh, I don't see another. Uh, uh, well, it will not be dystopia because she thinks that America, United States of America, is a great country. So, but. Do you know uh, think you should rule the whole world? I'm not so sure. I, I think she would be happy with that. But uh, uh, it, it does rule the world in a way. The, pro the problem, problem is that it, that it, it uh, uh, rules the world through the revolutions, right? And that's the irony, the, the dialectic. Uh, as a Hegelian, you know, I don't want the I don't like to explode the everything. I, I rather want to institute what already is. So my Arendtian idea is to write a new world constitution where what already is the fact simply is described, instituted, and thus becomes legitimate. And uh, all the constitutions, except for the Security Council countries, have inscribed in the constitution, there is a line, right to resistance, right to revolution. Not inscribed in the, uh, um, uh, in the constitution of the United States or Russia, because otherwise there will be a world war. <laughs> Maybe we can have Roger responding, let's say, in a... Uh, I'll be okay. brief, I guess. No, no, take your time in a, in a sort of concluding, maybe first concluding statement of this first block. Oh, I was talking so much here. No, and then right. uh, I sense some uh, uh, desire maybe to respond also from the, from the audience. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to... I'd love to get to the audience. I'll say a couple quick things, I hope. Take your time. Um, you know, about permanent revolution, I mean, there's that great line of Jefferson's that the tree of liberty must be watered by the blood of martyrs, right? Blood of patriots. Um, and, you know, she does quote that, and I think you're right, somewhat ironically. Um, the, the, the other line of Jefferson's that she's less ironic about is that the, the, the one real failure of the American Constitution, and she does say this was the great failure of the American Constitution, was to not provide an institutional space for the councils, for, for local government. Um, and here, I, I think um, Archelm is right. I mean, she, in another essay of hers, I think it's on violence, uh, she says that Lenin's great phrase, electrification plus yeah, the Soviets. She likes it. Well, she said it was great, except that he forgot the Soviets and made it just electrification. <laughs> um, the Soviets were the councils, and that you know the Soviets were the place where democracy and freedom could happen, where people could get together and talk, and new things could happen. And after a very short period, we got rid of the Soviets and just made it about the social question and electrification. And this, in her mind, was the point yeah. where this, the Russian Revolution failed, um, as opposed to uh, potentially could have succeeded if it had stuck with the Soviets. Yeah, and she praises Lenin for this formula. He saw, he saw right that there are two conditions of one. She praised him for the formula and dissed him for not living up to it. Yeah. The formulas are the easy part. Um, but uh, I just wanna, I wanna, I, I'm gonna do one thing and then, and then end, which is that it strikes me that if, and this is a way to bring it into contemporary politics as well. The, um, the general uh, belief today uh, amongst those on the left, and I'll stick with the left for now, um, but I think it's probably true for many on the right as well, is that freedom is no longer possible in government. Um, if you look at a lot of the great thinkers of the left today, and I'll mention three, um, Simon Critchley, David Graeber, and Jacques Rancière, they have all basically come to the conclusion that the only place and only way to pursue freedom in politics is through protest. And this comes back to the idea of permanent revolution. Basically what they say is government is a sclerotic, bureaucratic, corrupt institution. The state is always going to be about violence and about um, uh, necessity. And there's no way to um, make the state about freedom. Um, and out of this, what Simon Critchley calls this massive political disappointment, uh, what they do is they embrace a kind of anarchism. Um, 
a sense in which the way to imagine freedom, in David Graeber's words, is through constant protest, and in the protest against the state, to find what he calls spaces of freedom in which we can act against the state and against um, the political system. Um, all three of them, Ranciere, Graeber, and Critchley, um, speak in this language of freedom against the state, freedom um, against the, in Ranciere's words, um, uh, the police power of the state, which is the ordering power of the state. And it's against these three that I think, um, all of whom in many ways are indebted to Hannah Arendt uh, deeply, um, in which it's important to ask the question our Chiom asks, which is, well, what can we do today? The Leninist question. Uh, what can be done? And, um, and is there a way to resurrect the freedom of the councils, the Soviets, the town councils, whatever you want to call them? And, um, and in, in her essay uh, on violence, which to me is the essay that needs to be read, what is freedom, what is authority on violence and on revolution to me fit together? Maybe also um, uh, civil disobedience. But uh, on violence is an essay in which she says, the reason protests emerged in the 60s and the reason protests became the new way of pursuing freedom is because um, the, the bureaucratization and centralization of power in the Western democracies disempowered and disenfranchised the people and left them with no choice and no ability to find freedom in the act of participating in government. And so that freedom can only be found outside of government. Um, and she calls this a praxis in Zug, a withdrawal of action, and that they could then only find their action outside of politics, not in politics. Um, if there's a way around that, it seems to me it has to be through a regeneration of smaller, local, multiple, diverse, plural power sources. Um, and, uh, you know, this is why I find great hope in movements like the Tea Party on the right and now resistance on the left, or the resistance. I did not find the same hope in Occupy, although I was very intrigued by it, because Occupy saw itself as a protest movement and not as a political movement. Whereas I think the resistance now, in, in, in contradistinction to Occupy, is imagining itself as a, pro, as, a, as a governance movement, one in which local individuals and small groups around the country are re-engaging and finding meaningful um, uh, a meaning in political action. And to me, that's the hope um, of how we can possibly regenerate um, this idea. So I'll leave it at that, and uh, maybe we can no, let's open it up. It's probably time to open up. Yeah. yeah, let's open it up. Please, the floor is open for your questions, remarks, comments. They agree with me. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have one remark and one question, actually. Uh, the remark is, if the charter actually had what you said in it, it would actually be honest, so that would be good. Uh, second thing, I want to uh, ask Professor Berkowitz. Um, you said that in the American Revolution, uh, there was poverty but no misery. So even yeah, the, that's hard to Yeah, yeah, even the poorest ones actually had land at least. Um, so what do you think about the role of this economic abundance, in a sense, in the success of the American Revolution? Economic abundance. Economic abundance. Uh, well, uh, in some sense, if you mean by abundance just the fact that there was land, whereas there was free land and people who didn't have land could, could go west and, and find land, um, that contributed greatly to the, um, uh, the freedom and the idea of freedom in the American Revolution. Um, 
there's another way in which it actually was counterproductive uh, in that um, for her, and this is again a part of the book I didn't go into, but there was, a, there was an old formula of life, liberty, and property, which had been come from the continent. And if you know your um, declaration, it's, it's life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And um, she asked, why did they change it from life, liberty, and property to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? And she makes this argument, which uh, is somewhat historical, and I'm not sure how historically accurate it is, but it's an interesting argument re regardless, that um, there was a there were two different meanings of happiness that were floating around in the 18th century. One was private happiness, which was the more economic argument, and one was public happiness, which was this idea of acting in public and being visible. And what she says is that Thomas Jefferson, who had written the um, Virginia Declaration, Virginia, what's it called? Compact. What? The Compact. No. Anyway, in another thing that he had written, you know, he wrote the Declaration, but he also wrote um, the Articles of the Virginia, whatever. In that, he didn't use pursuit of happiness, he used public happiness. Mm -hmm. And what she says is that when he uses the pursuit of happiness in the Declaration, he really means this idea of public happiness, this idea of being visible. And, um, and that to him, uh, to be human, you have to be visible. This is what I mean by acting and speaking in ways that matter in public. And the great evil of slavery is not misery or poverty, it's invisibility. This is part of her argument. Um, and, and so the problem, she says, and the reason, one reason the American Constitution ends up failing is that there were two conflicting ideas of America. One was an idea of public happiness, and one was an idea of private happiness. And to the extent that the idea of private happiness wins out, and the idea of milk and honey and plenty uh, wins out, we trade public happiness for private happiness. And so abundance, in a way, is the root of the loss of the, um, of the, of the, of the freedom, of the American idea of freedom. Um, but in the early parts, in the 18th century, I think you're, you're not wrong. The idea of abundance and free land uh, did allow um, for the um, avoidance of misery that was felt in the urban cities and ghettos of Europe, which she didn't see. There was misery in the U.S., but it was invisible, and that's and that's the slavery, and and that's that's the original sin that she calls it, and that's that's a question that I think. You know, I mean, I think this is, this is in many sense the question of contemporary American politics. It's not European politics. But if you think of the American idea as a land of freedom and equality and a balance between those in some way, and you think of this as Arendt's view as in some way having some sense, the problem is can that idea survive the incorporation of groups that were specifically um, excluded from it at the beginning. And those of those who believe in the American idea believe it can, that the idea is powerful enough to bring everybody into it. The American creed can, can incorporate that. There are many people, um, like ta Coates and others, who argue that it can't, that basically the creed was a racist creed. There is a white supremacist country in its roots and there's no way to, um, uh, to actually uh, make America a land of freedom because the entire premise of America is a racist, white supremacist presence. Um, so that's, I think, one of the biggest debates going on right now in certain, in certain <laughs> circles in the United States. Thank you. Could you talk a little bit about social media um, and... <laughs> Social media. And Has that voice Aaron of didn't freedom. write about social media, that's for sure. Huh? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> as that as that like space of freedom yeah. that is, is global now and maybe do we need other 
is that the space where we have to be? It's probably for other reasons. I have something to say. I know, what, I know I what you will say, but... Well, I don't know. I, I, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I find this... So let's leave let it this way. There have been, you know, as we run the RN Center, we get sent stuff all the time. And I mean, there have been more papers written on RN and social media than any other thinker, that's for sure. <laughs> Precisely for the reason I think you're asking the question, which is that people are asking, is this a way to resurrect this idea of, of, of power and involvement and engagement? Um, and, uh, you know, there's been a lot of very interesting, thoughtful, stuff written about it, not, I don't think in the end, it's convincing. But to me, the issue is, is, is this. Um, so she takes a lot of this from Tocqueville. And the line in Tocqueville that means the most in the entire 600-page book to me is, 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 is his line that the spirit of freedom um, came out of the townships which were coarse and prejudiced. And always were in a, opposed by the civilizing forces of the elite. And this is an extraordinary insight of Tocqueville's. And what he's basically saying is freedom is uncivilized. Freedom is prejudiced. Freedom is coarse. Freedom is local people saying and doing things together. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, social media gets that part of it and activates that part of it. And it is coarse and prejudiced and disgusting and free in some way. But the difference is that in a township or in a council, you've got to live with the people. You see them and all of them. And not just the people on your feed, but all the people in your town. And you have to decide how many schools are we going to build. Are we going to raise taxes and lower taxes? Are we going to buy a, a new lamp or a new road? So you think it has to be involved with space, physical space? I think there's, I think there's a couple things at issue. One is physical space and seeing people, looking them in the eyes. Right? I think looking people in the eyes is one of the great civilizing forces even among prejudicial worlds. And I think if you're simply casting aspersions on social media, there's never any consequences to it, and it's disgusting. And so I think you don't have the fact that you have to wake up in the morning and maybe go to get coffee and walk by the people the next day. And that, to me, is a really dangerous part of social media. The second part of it is we actually have to work together to build lamps or streets. I'm, I may be with um, Tomas in wanting to build a school, but with our children wanting to cut taxes. I actually have to talk to both of them. And so we actually, in a, in a, in, we actually have to somehow argue, but still remain civil and talk to each other. And I think without the, both the spatial limitation, but also the political idea, um, I think social media can't replace in any meaningful way. It can provide freedom, but a completely anarchic and prejudicial and mean freedom without the civilizing forces of, of, of encounter and of working together to create a common world with people not just on your inter internet feed. And that to me is a, a big difference. You might have other... I, I have a, a slightly different angle because I think the uh, social media as they exist now actually more or less resolve this particular concern. Because look, uh, the uh, immediately when you have uh, friends on social media, immediately there is a pressure to de-virtualize. There is a certain dialectic of social media. Uh, they, they, they do not virtualize our reality. They uh, thematize the virtuality and uh, reality. Uh, therefore, it's uh, as recently as someone said that um, uh, it's very easy now to get uh, 100,000 people on the streets. It's not even a great achievement, no, no reason to say that this is a great revolution never seen, no. Couple posts uh, on Facebook, uh, favorable uh, environment, a uh, couple accidents, and that's it. 100,000. Uh, is this a revolution, as Roger rightly put the question with regard to like these color revolutions? Uh, the, the, so, the, um, um, uh, it's a long conversation, but to, to cut it short, I would say that the danger of the social media is the 
In Russian, we call it false start. Uh, for, uh, false start. False start. Can we can false say start? false start? That it's too quick. You need to. Um, yeah. You know, uh, uh, Heidegger, uh, unlike Arendt, he, uh, they share a lot. But uh, Heidegger always said, like, why do, does everyone so, is so uh, in a hurry, to, in in a haste to act? Maybe one has to think first and then to act. And actually, Arendt, by the end of her life, I think, moved closer to this position. I have two questions. Susan and first. Yeah, um, this um, attempt to define the political as somehow separate from economics and law, even, is, um, is paradoxical to me. And I just want to say respect also to the question about slavery and its impact on the United States. Slavery wasn't just about prejudice. And it wasn't even that prejudiced in the beginning, necessarily. I mean, there were many alliances between you know, slaves and poor uh, indentured servants, for example, in the beginning. But it was the entire foundation of the uh, industrialization, the, tri tri the triangle trade, right? It, so I wonder how you can you know, kind of leave, or how she can leave the economics and ownership, uh, ownership of the means of production even, okay, to use the old Marxist uh, phrase, out of the picture. Yeah. Um, she's dead, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, I mean, so there's, there's two parts to that question. I'm going to take the second part of your question first, and if you may answer also the first, and we'll come back to it. There's two parts to the second part. One is simply descriptive. And she's making a descriptive claim. And what she does is she quotes the founders, and she quotes numerous European visitors who visited the United States in the late 18th century. And what she says is they just, none of them talked about slavery. That wasn't, they didn't see it. And which, I mean, obviously they saw it in some way, but what she's saying is simply on a descriptive level, um, they ignored it. And she thinks that's an unethical, she makes a very strong claim that that was an unethical and, and, and mistaken view. Uh, but she thinks it happened. And so, um, so we start there. Um, she then says that even though it was an unethical and mistaken view, um, it was one of the reasons that America, unlike any of these other revolutions, were able to focus on freedom and not the social question. Um, is that a, you know, is that worth it? You know, I'm not trying to say it is or isn't. She, I'm just saying she, that's how she that's how she frames it, and um, she says. Uh, then the question is, could, um, can it be that the foundation and institutions of freedom can, um, are strong enough that they can uh, persist even as we end slavery and, and, uh, and bring women and, 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 and African Americans and other groups who were excluded from politics? Um, into the political realm. She doesn't give an answer to that. Um, she, I think that's the question I think she, she raises. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think that none of that takes away your point that slavery was um, a profoundly important um, uh, part of the American uh, economic and social and even political landscape. I think you're absolutely right. I don't think she would disagree with you. I think she would say the Constitution, which doesn't mention slavery, um, uh, was, in her mind, um, very much uh, designed to institute this idea of freedom. And the question is, can it, can it persist? Uh, can it somehow still remain about freedom and not about the social question as we bring increasing numbers of groups over time back into the, uh, into the fold. But when you say the social question, you mean the socioeconomic question. It means, it means everything. I mean, it, it, the social question most abstractly for her is the question of necessity. Um, 
this, you know, that, 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 that politics is about dealing with necessities as opposed to providing a space for freedom. She has a definition of society. Society is this hybrid of politics and private sphere. When they collide yeah. and this happens in the 19th century, then all the problems start. And then the revolution is part of it. So, um, on, you know, I, on, on the other question, she doesn't think politics excludes all economics. I mean, you know, I know that's a typical way she's, she's read. Um, of course politics includes economics. We have to decide how much to tax ourselves, we have to decide to buy sc build schools or build roads or, or, or build, or who knows, you know, welfare or health care or, these are all economic issues and she thinks they're all part of politics. So I, I think it's a, it, it's a misconception to think that she doesn't think economic issues are part of politics. What she does, what, what she doesn't, what, what her, her point is, <laughs> that in debating about economic issues um, and in thinking about economic issues, um, we can't sacrifice freedom to necessity. And if we see politics is only about economic issues and it is so predominantly about it that what really matters is not that we are debating it and thinking about it, but that we're going to create bureaucracies and use executive orders to solve the necessity question, then we privilege necessity over freedom, and then we lose um, what the, the, the way in which politics goes about itself, which of course includes talking about economic issues. But if you're so interested in <clears throat> overcoming necessity that you are willing to take shortcuts and shortcut the political process in order to get what you want, that's dangerous to her. That will sacrifice freedom to necessity. This, this was the question from the Russian Revolution, which brings mm -hmm. us back, because that was the key mm -hmm. question of the Russian Revolution to relieve right. not slaves, but uh, almost slaves who were proletarians and peasants. And uh, of course, so that was, that's what Lenin would uh, have responded if he read Hannah Arendt. Uh, okay, all of that very interesting, but we are not about this. Uh, we, we, we are about uh, people who are, uh, uh, you know, have been exploited for centuries, uh, who uh, constitute a, a class uh, uh, of uh, like uh, uh, sober, um, uh, laborious human beings, and who are treated as uh, scum. Uh, and uh, our task is simply to uh, give these people uh, power, to give these people a, a dignified life, and to take care that such people don't exist anymore. Uh, it's a very difficult task, and Arhan Arendt is absolutely right that this can only be resolved with violence. There is no imaginable way how you can resolve this particular task without violence. Uh, and then the question is, uh, when you do it, do you still leave the space for politics? Do you still want to be faithful to the models of republics and democracies of, of, the, of the past with these poor people, the proletarians, etc.? And Lenin first thought light-mindedly that he could combine this, but then he decided that it was made no sense. No, Lenin, until the very end, he, he called himself a democrat, because he thought that democracy is about bringing masses to power. Uh, and not about the institution. He was probably mistaken, but so mis as mistaken are those who think democracy is only about the uh, rules of the game and not about the actual man. Okay. Yeah, uh, my question actually was sort of to bring discussion back a little bit back to the Russian context and talk a little bit about the Russian Revolution. And um, it seems to me that. Um, uh, Rand sort of dismisses the Russian Revolution, right? I mean, I mean, she borrows some seminal points from it, like the idea of councils, mm -hmm. but at the same time, by and large, she basically claims that it's a failed sort of experiment, right? So my question is, to what extent, uh, what is her attitude toward the Russian Revolution? I mean, the Russian Revolution was a complex event, after all. I mean, it was just two revolutions, right? It wasn't just Lenin take, taking over and, and kind of, you know, basically uh, screwing it up, you know? I mean, they had the February Revolution as well, which was democratic to some extent, you know? I mean, does she draw the distinction between the two revolutions, or does she, does, does she like, lump it all in one? 
like Leninist revolution, basically. What does she mean by Russian revolution? Is it there implicitly or explicitly? Oh, she mentions it several times, uh, certainly, and she even, uh, yeah, as, as we mentioned, gives credit to Lenin for seeing the problem of Soviets and mm -hmm. for seeing that uh, the question of authority is there too. Uh, uh, but uh, basically, from the moment that Lenin decides to suppress the councils, consciously or not, uh, he, she thinks it's over. Uh, uh, I think. As I, I already said, that I think it's a, in, the, in this regard, it's a highly ideological book with a clear uh, ideological task. So uh, you could not, I mean, she, she's as generous as she can be. Mm. Uh, it's not a very good or strong source on uh, the Russian Revolution, which she actually, did, she actually dismisses, and uh, uh, she thinks that it led straight to totalitarianism, on which she uh, wrote her famous uh, uh, right, right. Book, uh, so, but she's thinking in terms of Leninist revolution, right? What about the February revolution? The I liberal don't know, so she makes this interesting right. distinction. I wonder, you know, between professional revolutionaries mm -hmm. and yeah, the men of the right. revolution, mm -hmm. or the en lettre, and 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 and, mm -hmm. and she she thinks that the, <clears throat> the the Russian revolution was led by what she calls professional revolutionaries, people mm -hmm. who saw the world in dialectical terms as fulfilling a historical necessity, mm -hmm. and thus. They saw their their role as simply playing a role that history had set for them to make this happen, rather than people who were living in the moment and acting freely and trying to start something new. And so she is somewhat contemptuous of of it. I mean, I think our challenge. She mentioned she mentioned the Super revolution, uh, but again, it's uh, because there were Soviets emerging from it right. again. But at the same time, I mean, it seems to me if she's talking about professional revolution, she means Leninist, you know, the, the clandestine party, right? Uh, she's not talking about lawyers who came to power or the liberals who came to power in February. I mean, they were not professional revolutionaries by any stretch of imagination, right? And they yeah, didn't know what the Liberal they revolutionaries, come on. They, they, they were involved for Social, months, uh, okay, the SR and the SRs. SRs right, were right. much okay. more important, but they but were... Kerensky, I mean, Kerensky, was he a revolutionary? No, he was just a... He was just a politician, right? He was, he was a revolution. Kerensky, he was yeah. a radical socialist. Come on. Uh, there was just a, a new book on Kerensky by my colleague from the European University, Boris Kolonitsky. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he shows that Kerensky elaborated a model that Lenin and Stalin uh, later followed. He was the first Bonapartist leader okay. of, the, of the revolution. <laughs> but, but of course, he, went, he came from a very leftist uh, background. Well, he was, uh, okay, he was not the, the most radical of the SRs, but... Uh, mm -hmm. Socially, certainly. Uh, yeah, it was a big event when he uh, made it into into the government. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyway, so uh, Russian Revolution uh, was, of course, all, uh, 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 the greatest event uh, um, and the uh, the, re the revolution that uh, de defined the course of the 20th century. And Arendt herself was in in, in, in part a fruit of it, but uh, she was. Uh, uh, of course, uh, very um, predisposed against it because it ended with Stalinism, and we can understand why. Yes, Stalinism it was indeed a disaster. The question is um, how it, it is related to the revolution itself, and whether there, well, of course, there is much more to the revolution than, than Stalinism, and we now start to uh, discover it. So I had a point on Russian Revolution. However, there were many bad things about, it, but there was one good. Thing about it, which Arjun doesn't pay enough attention to, uh, and it is in its international character. Uh, Arjun always talks about sp councils. Uh, she likes spontaneity. She uh, favorably cites Rosa Luxemburg against Lenin. She she adores Rosa Luxemburg. It's her role model. So, by the way, also a person from this revolutionary period. But she thinks she reads Rosa Luxemburg as a theorist of spontaneity, as an anarchist of a sort. This is all very nice in terms of like this uh, existential Dasein uh, 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 revo 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 revolutionism, but uh, existence revolutionism we could call it. But uh, at the same time, uh, 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 if you only do spontaneous revolutions, they be they remain local. They are too linked to here and now. Speaking of the social media, it's very dangerous because um, uh, again, uh, in today's Russia. Yeah, uh, Putin is uh, very easily, uh, you know, uh, delegitimizes revolutions by saying that look, they say they are spontaneous, but they are financed from the West. 
many parts of uh, some revolutions, of course, are financed from the West, so the West influences them. So all of this idea of spontaneity is, I think, a uh, very dubious one. Lenin, <laughs> well, he actually he did mind sp uh, spontaneity, he called it stichinist, which is not the same thing. But he said, well, uh, we do, uh, should not make it uh, a mystery that we have an organization and that uh, we actually uh, coordinate many spontaneous events and develop workers' consciousness so that they uh, come from the mere strikes and councils to the vision of organizing the reality. Because, and, but this vision of organizing the reality was international. And Lenin was acting as one of the soldiers or colonels of a big international party, which was the second international, and then after the war it was third international. So, uh, he, he never thought about himself as a national Russian hero, you know, the Narodnik. No, and that's what's precisely the difference with Narodnik. And I think that's why he won, uh, because uh, everyone knew he got German money. Our colleague, uh, Sean uh, McMeekin, just published a, a book about this, and, uh, right? To show that, of course, they took German money. Who wouldn't? But... <laughs> but this in any this didn't harm them in any at, at, like uh, event at, 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 at any moment no one cared I mean their constituency didn't care that they took this German money because everyone knew that this is the uh, party against the war and this is a party that is tightly related to the German per German uh, social democracy and uh, to, to to suspect that uh, yeah, uh, uh, Lenin is uh, uh, going to uh, support the acting German government. It's absurd because the, the, prog the problem of German social democracy is no, even that some of them were pro war, so that's another thing. Mm -hmm. So I turn it over to the next question, just a footnote. That, uh, in, in 1956, the Hungarian Revolution happened. Ireland, in a very look, Rosa Luxemburgian a uh, gesture responded to that event and wrote uh, a long essay uh, that then became the final chapter for one of the editions of, to of the Origins of Totalitarianism. When she, wanted, uh, when she planned to publish that essay as a book in Germany, it was meant to be dedicated to Rosa Luxemburg, which the publisher didn't want in 1956. That was the German publisher didn't want that, uh, that dedication to, to Rosa Luxemburg, but I think it's a it's a uh, it's a trace of of her uh, intrigue in the way in which reality thinks about politics, right? That sometimes th things happen in in the world, and these things that happen, uh, uh, let's say, invent that's a concept of, of action, for example, that uh, theorists haven't thought about, and therefore. Uh, ought to be told as a story so that they can, can be um, uh, can be discussed, so to speak. Right? There's always that straddling of the of the way that the world, let's say, uh, thinks about politics through things that emerge, and the historians or theorists or reporters who uh, understand and and convey and and preserve uh, that. I think the. Rosa Luxemburg then really is, 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 a, is, is another partner, I think, or interlocutor in exactly that double role. Can I just ask a question? Did she yeah. ever publish that book in Europe on what the Hungarian Revolution is? It, later on, it came. Uh, uh, it was published as an individual. Um, By her. Yeah, well, well, no, no, she did publish it, but without the uh, without the dedication to Rosa Luxemburg because the publisher. Uh, so she published it in her life. Yeah. Because she removed it from all mm. further English. Right. She, re um, she then removed it from the uh, from the origins publication and replaced it by the ideology and terror. Well, it was a post uh, They removed it. I mean, it was interesting. A number of years ago, Christopher Hitchens came here and gave a talk at our first Hunter and Center conference, mm -hmm. and he offered a, a speculation on that, which was that she removed it because afterwards, when she read. A biography of, of, of Luxembourg and then read more about the Hungarian Revolution, she realized how anti-Semitic the, anti the Hungarian Revolution councils had been. Mm -hmm. And he thought that might have been why she removed it, but maybe not. I, I, it's just a, something that's been in my head since he mm -hmm. gave that talk. Uh, is it published, Hitchens' uh, yeah. argument? It's published in the, uh, in the 
Thinking in Dark Times volume that we from that, mm -hmm. that I edited. Because I also have, you know, I, I, I refer to this uh, 50, the Hungarian text uh, because there she precisely is the same deadlock. Uh, she says uh, spontaneous uprising cancels, but we all know that it was immediately overdetermined geopolitically, and that's why it was crushed. Uh, Soviets didn't like uh, immediately plan to crush it, but as you know, they they, they said that they would uh, exit the Warsaw Pact and. Uh, that meant uh, that they immediately go to NATO, and uh, um, uh, and then uh, uh, the Soviets were absolutely sure, as we now know from archives, that this is the CIA who organized this revolution, which was not true. <laughs> but at this, at the same time, uh, it we cannot say that America was not responsible at all, and that it was uh, purely spontaneous uprising, because of course the Radio Free Europe, like was talking 24 hours a day, like, do it, make a revolution, make a revolution. Hungarians did make a revolution, then suddenly America didn't support them, so they were really upset. Mm -hmm. uh, so all of these things has become oh, immediately so uh, int uh, intertwined with international politics that without a strong international party and international vision, I think they are all doomed. Or, or we need to make this kind of the the aforementioned uh, UN Constitutional Charter, which I propose. <laughs> That's a very fascinating idea, actually. It's a good Uber authority. <laughs> Send me another question. Oh, no, that's a question. So, I mean, my question goes back to what we were talking about earlier. So, Roger, you said that the moment of Constitution was the moment of success for the revolution in the context of the United States in response to our Tumi. But for Arun, it's also precisely the moment of failure. It's when also the moment, there's the moment of revolution, the moment of constitution, which is the, in part the success of revolution, but it's also the failure of revolution in the United States because it fails to incorporate the spirit of revolution. And the spirit of revolution is the spirit of public freedom, the ability to appear in public and to act politically and be recognized and remembered. And in that sense, if we follow Arendt's logic, then doesn't political action or public freedom have to happen against political institutions that are founded? Don't they have to happen outside of the institutions founded by the moment of constituting? if the moment of constituting is what undermines the possibility of public freedom. I don't, I mean, I, I don't, I don't accept either part of that, I guess. Um, so, I mean, the moment of constitution is not uh, a moment at which the spirit of revolution dies, I think. Uh, in fact, on, on the contrary, I think um, sh she does believe that the Constitution, through its Federalist and Republican principles, very much uh, keeps alive and reflects the spirit of revolution. Where it failed, and I said this before, and I think it's true, is that it failed to provide an institutional foundation for um, councils and the spirit and that spirit, and that over time. Um, the institutional spaces for that freedom in towns and counties and states um, were swallowed up through two things, the three things, I guess. The rising national security state, the uh, progressive uh, uh, nationalization of, of power, and uh, the corruption of the body politic through its concern with money and uh, abundance. Um, those are the three things that she thinks corrupts the original spirit. Um, so on the first hand, I, I, I don't think at the moment of constitution we lose the spirit of revolution. I think she thought this constitution very much had it. I think she made, thinks it made a mistake and an oversight that became visible um, to Jefferson later. Um, and then to your to your question, you know, to the to the consequence that we can only therefore uh, imagine freedom in opposition to the state or government, I guess is is, is your point. Um, I mean I guess I mean I think that's 
that's the point of most of the left today. That's Chris Simons, Chris Lee's point, David Graeber's point, Ron Sierra, and, David, and many others. And I think the reason they're all influenced by Arendt, but the reason they all are opposed to Arendt is because her fundamental view is that freedom has to exist in a political community. The, the fundamental human right is to be part of a political community. And um, I don't see but this. But a political as a, community can exist within a revolution, which is not yet properly a state. Yeah, but a revolution is. So I mean, you're, you're, you then you're back to Art Gilm's permanent revolution. And I don't see her as a thinker of permanent revolution. I think she's a thinker of permanent discussion and debate and, and, and freedom and action and experience, but she wants to create meaningful governmental uh, worlds in which we govern ourselves and we, and we build public institutions. Then what does the spirit of revolution look like in vigorous public debate? In what? In, in public debate, in those conversations. <laughs> Otherwise, the spirit of revolution doesn't exist within the institutional framework. I don't understand the question. I mean, the spirit of revolution is the spirit of freedom. It comes out of the townships, and it's and it's part of what it means to be um, engaged in uh, the creation of public power. Uh, to act together with others is what power is. Public power is to act together with others in the attempt to found lasting institutions. That's what she thought the American government did, and I think it's what she thinks we should be doing. I'm not sure I understand what your question. But we're not founding the government today, so if we're thinking about what it means well, we to we engage, to to think about what it means to engage in, let's say, local politics, which would be the equivalent of town councils today to think about Arendt's conception of freedom as appearance in public. It's, I mean, in some respects, it seems deeply contradictory. On the one hand, because in order to actually appear in public today, um, you have to have, right, on the one hand, a certain amount of social stability and necessity, right, in order to appear. And at the same time, the social questions for Arendt are fundamentally not political and don't have a place I, I think in fair. those I, political debates. Well, there's, and there's, there's not many people yeah. who care. Go no, there's not, there aren't that many people that care? <laughs> no, I said I, I think that most people today can appear in public. I mean, illegal immigrants can appear it's in public. It's not just about appearance, Farrant, though. It's about recognition in appearance in a proper political space. Political spaces today do not only exist within the confines of established political institutions. Well, you know that I agree. Well, so then, what does what does a politics of appearance and freedom look like outside of the institutional framework for Arendt in the revolutionary sense, right? Because the revolution precedes the moment of institutions. Well, the question is, do you want to found institutions that will last? And if you do, I then I would say you're not outside the governmental or political. You're not, you know. And if you want to found freedom. If you want simply to create moments of freedom and permanent revolution, you can do what you're suggesting. But if you actually want to found um, freedom in a way that lasts, uh, I don't think you can. So. I mean, it's like one way to, because the, this, this reading of, of Arendt is, uh, I did, uh, you mentioned authors who are very prominent, uh, the point of saying is Arendt's uh, acting as uh, the constitution of of freedom, and yet the institution is, let's say, the the danger towards that. Yeah. Isn't that the combination, or the maybe impossible combination, of a of an Arendtian and a Marxist idea that an institution is a reification that would be an alienation, that is seen as an alienation from that uh, you know spirit of yeah. uh, of action. So that this is, so to speak, the the, the view that would um, uh, theorize the alienation between the spirit of action and the institution as the reified and alienated thing. Uh, I don't know if this combination really works, but that's yeah, yes, exactly. that's yeah. Tanya, I'm not sure my question, but um, I don't know. I I'm interested also in the role of semantics in revolution. Uh, because it feels that 
um, the October Revolution, as I learned, it was you know we call it. Um, it became once. I think in a way the difference is that the Soviet Revolution coined and appropriated the word revolution in a branding situation where it meant. Uh, well, you know it was French meant. Revolution. During the French Revolution, they, they coined the word, yeah, the, as in, the, in the current meaning. Yeah, they coined the word, but I think that after the Soviet Revolution, it became uh, almost like a brand, you know. It, it mm -hmm. was actually an exporting brand, yeah. in okay. a way, right? Okay. And she tried to intercept the brand, that's <laughs> what I was saying. Yeah. But, so I wonder, where, what are the spaces of freedom? In that, in that revolution, the Soviet revolution, if the councils are envisioned and directed by the people in the high power? No. No. Uh, not in the, in the in original the Cuban revolution, uh, yes. conception. So, in what? In the Cuban revolution, it was. Ah, in the Cuban <laughs> revolution, of course. So <laughs> the translation was lost, apparently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but this idea that actually the, it almost feels that the revolution become after a while in the theatrics of the revolution. Mm -hmm. You know, and how do you reconcile those two notions when, let's say, the Soviet keep telling to the world this is a revolution, and they are building on top of that, yeah. selling it to everybody. The same way the Americans are selling freedom, because yeah. Americans yeah, are doing the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. The Russians are doing the same, the Soviet. How you reconcile the idea of freedom if all of these spaces for public appearance, as we are talking, are being orchestrated, authorized, and directed by those in government? Even demanded. Sometimes you are demanded yeah. to go out and manifest. Yeah. Certainly, I mean, if we look at the mature socialism, and, you know, uh, and, and the, 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 its role in, in some countries, we see that. Even though, well, from what I understand, Cuba in the 60s was different. Mm -hmm. So, uh, one thing is, if you organize a revolution, then you orchestrate it. I think it's a little bit like the nightmare of Putin about how the color revolutions are organized. But I don't think it's true. And I don't think that uh, it's so, so easy to orchestrate a revolution. It, in many cases, you start it off, uh, but, and then something unpredictable happens. I mean, any revolution, including the French, was always supported by someone from abroad. You cannot, I mean, meddling in America's election, you know, everyone everywhere, uh, uh, and, and um, uh, uh, always uh, intervened and meddled into other countries' elections. And uh, so uh, the same is true about uh, revolution. The other thing is that uh, if you really have this uh, image of the Soviet bureaucrat sent to Cuba and uh, he says, okay, here, here, and here, you build the Soviet, please give me the report, please, uh, I will sign all the lists of participants and uh, all their rejoinders, please have to be uh, signed by our literature department. So uh, this is, uh, <laughs> of course, as you rightly say, a comedy. Yeah. But um, I just, I, I, I suspect that it is rarely the case. I don't know. Is what? It's rarely the case. It's very difficult to do. And uh, I, I frankly have some sympathy even for this. I mean, at least, okay, it's a comedy, but it's a nice comedy. Yeah. People, uh, people enjoy the show. Uh, uh, there is no, I mean, I mean they, it's, uh, they pay the, their tribute to the civic uh, culture and to, uh, uh, you know, so late Soviet Union, we now see its virtues. Uh, it, it had this uh, uh, totally comic uh, allegiance to revolution, but it still was the allegiance to revolution. There were values of freedom, there were values of equality uh, taught in school. There was a training in civic activism in the artificial environment. It's much better than what it is now, where it's brutal cynicism. You know. So there are three final uh, questions. I would uh, suggest that we collect them and that you maybe both can give wrapping up. I just want to say one thing to Tanya, Please. which is yeah. just a very short story. I, and I don't know what to make of this. Right? It's, mm -hmm. But Arendt began this work on this book on revolution at a seminar in Princeton. And at the seminar in Princeton, Fidel Castro spoke. Mm -hmm. And she apparently was there, but I'm not sure. Um, 
in any case, she doesn't cite much about Cuba, doesn't cite much about it. But in that seminar, in his speech, apparently, Castro distinguished the French from the Cuban Revolution and associated the Cuban Revolution with the American Revolution, not the French Revolution. Oh. It's actually a really interesting... Because he was in the United States. Okay, Not but all I'm saying is there's an interesting... <laughs> if someone ever wanted to do a project on this, it would be an interesting yeah. project because yeah. uh, there's a there's apparently there's some sort of history there to be unearthed, and I haven't done it. Mm -hmm. um. um, Susan, and right there was a third question. Given that no revolution has ever fully succeeded by Arendt's criteria, do you think it would ever be possible that one could especially considering the world that we're living in today. Okay, question one. Yeah, so maybe this follows from there. I'm trying, still struggling with the, you know, the question about is it, if it's all political, how can it deal with economics, and if it's, if it's focused on the local and the so Soviets, which I, yeah, I love, but how does it deal with the larger questions? And I wanted to raise the example, uh, I think it may have been the city of Richmond in California that tried to respond to the foreclosures by invoking eminent domain. And it means that the government has the power to take property. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't believe they succeeded, but that would be an example of the kind of conundrum that you would face in trying to use local, you know, local Soviets or local councils or local city even governments or town governments to, mm -hmm. to address these much larger yeah. forces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I suppose this is mostly addressed the Russia. I apologize to the other speaker. Um, I've been listening to you, and it seems like um, the spirit of the revolution isn't a passion for acting, a passion for acting freely, for, you know, for it to be seen in a meaningful way, but it's, it's more the will to preserve the space where that happens. And uh, it struck me as a meaningful distinction, and I wanted to know what you thought about it. All right, I'll, do, I'll give three quick answers, and then you give three quick answers. Um, so to Sam's question, Sam, um, I actually think there was a successful revolution. I think Aaron thinks the American Revolution was a successful revolution. I mean, this is where maybe Sam and I disagree. Uh, I think she thinks it founded freedom, and it lasted for a certain amount of time, and it's been corrupted. Uh, the whole last part of the book is about the corruption of the American Revolution. Um, and the lost treasure. Uh, I think it did succeed. I think it can succeed again. And the key to um, having it succeed again, whether it's through a new revolution or a regeneration, the other one goes to Susan's question, which is um, through the re-energizing uh, of the revolutionary spirit, which I take to be the spirit of freedom. And what Richmond did is exactly the kind of stuff that towns have to do. I mean, one of the things that RN, you know, loves talking about is that when towns do something and then the state or the federal government says no, if the town doesn't back down, they have to decide whether to go in with the army or not. And, you know, sometimes they will, but in many times they won't. And the point is that local government, local power, if people really support it, has a lot more power than people think they do, and thus a lot more freedom. I mean, you see this with the sanctuary movements today and other things. Um, I, I am a big believer that if a group of people in a town get together and act and really are behind their action, is the federal government going to really come in and make them stop selling pot? Well, I mean, we've seen mm -hmm. this, right? They haven't done it. Uh, you know, I think that obviously there's limits to that, and there are times when you have a crisis, but um, freedom is risky, and she thinks that you have to take risks in order to be free. And, uh, and so I think what towns like Richmond and others are doing is exactly the kind of free acts that others might say are illegal and uncivilized and unconstitutional and unruly that she thinks is the freedom. And uh, if we start doing that again and people get excited about fighting, then I think you can actually fight within politics and not just from the outside. Um, that would be, that's also my, my response to both Sam's, I guess. Um, as for Richard's question, um, 
that the revolutionary spirit is in the will to preserve a space for it? I, I, I don't think it's in the will. I, I guess, no, I mean, I, I'm going to stick with our end on this. I think, I mean, yeah, we can today theorize it in our own sense of theory, but I don't think that's what she saw the revolutionary spirit as. The revolutionary spirit is the people who do it. The people in Richmond who take their acts or the people in sanctuary cities who are willing to risk fighting for the government because they're fighting together and acting with people they believe. So to me, um, we need to re-energize people to risk their security and their safety and their livelihood to fight for what they believe in. And that's what freedom is, as far as I understand it. Not. And yes, you can do it as protest, but I don't think that in the end will, I think that in the end always imagines itself from the outside in a way that it can make a difference. I think protest can be political, but I think in the way that protest is imagined today, it's specifically not supposed to make a difference. It's supposed to be about the performance. It's almost theatrical. And that's what David Graeber, in his 600-page book on direct action, it's about not actually changing politics because he doesn't think changing politics matters. And that's why I think someone like Michael White is getting sick and tired of the left on this stuff who spoke at the conference. And, and I think he's right. That's why I like Michael White's work. Yeah. As for the future revolution, uh, certainly there will be a revolution, I would think. But, uh, uh, the, uh, and uh, again, these local revolutions, they happen every month, so uh, it's not even a question. And they, some of them are relatively successful. Again, I disagree. If I think that if a revolution happened in a country and everyone is uh, enthusiastic, participates in the institutions, uh, watches TV, uh, with uh, a lot of uh, desire and anxiety, uh, then it's a revolution. And uh, again, in Ukraine, we just had one recently. Um, uh, the question is, uh, what <laughs> does it make sense uh, globally? And uh, I think that uh, here, I, 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 in a larger framework, uh, I am very skeptical about uh, one intellectual movement of the 20th century, which is existential. And uh, Arendt is the political existentialist. Uh, uh, she ha uh, there are good things that she derives from it, but, the, but she, is in, in many ways, shares the destiny of this, mo of this movement because, after all, it's a very you know, ad hoc and opportunist kind of political ethics. Uh, okay, let's make a revolution. Why? For, for what purpose? Uh, against whom? Ab absolutely unclear. I think you need first a vision. If you have a, a, a project, how to organize the world, with a lot of participation and constant and all that, then you can make a revolution. Uh, and then you will make a revolution, because a superior idea always wins in history. Maybe not very soon. And uh, that responds also to Susan's question, because again, sometimes the local council would be beneficial and uh, more um, uh, you know, enlightened and democratic than the government. Sometimes it's vice versa. And, uh, the very, and, and I agree with Roger that, of course, this protest uh, thinking is very you know, short-sighted. Uh, there should be a theory of how a government, or not simply government, simply authority, public authority, government, uh, is organized democratically. Uh, there is certainly is a difference between, I don't know, Soviet bureaucrats and, uh, I don't know, even even an American bureaucrat would be okay, not not the ideal, but at least he or she would be smiling, talk to you. Um, uh, there is a difference. There are different ways of, of doing bureaucracy, but of course, this doesn't mean that we should simply uh, reduce politics to the, uh, uh, the activity of uh, politicians in uh, in Congress uh, or Senate, because it's a very bureaucratized bureaucratized environment, very limited. So that's certainly not what I meant. Etc. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roger, for this inspiring conversation.